in Georgetown before, before I move into um, today's event. Uh, our I just want to say that this is our first event for Souls Nua after our sold out, record breaking, et cetera, et cetera. Really, actually, truly fantastic. Um, yes and yes dance performance by the Liz Roach Dance Company um, just last weekend. Um, uh, so check out um, all of our upcoming conversations, our podcasts, our book groups, our films to watch at home, and more at solusnua.org. Um, and of course, be sure to get tickets for BC Adogan and Roddy Doyle's new take on John Millington Singh's classic play, Playboy the Western World, which runs at the Atlas Performing Arts Center from November 3 to November 20. That will be our sort of in-person play uh, this autumn. Uh, and for those of, us who are uh, those of you who are joining us by Global Irish Studies, we have a packed semester coming up, uh, already started a couple of weeks ago. And our next event is this coming Tuesday with the European Ombudsman, um, Emily O'Reilly. And then next Tuesday, the I should have written this down, the 4th of October, um, we will welcome poet and memoirist Sean Hewitt. Both events will be in person. And the Sean Hewitt event will also be broadcast live and recorded for you to watch later. So check it all out at globalirish.georgetown.edu. That's the end of the um, parish announcements. Um, I have a much more exciting task uh, today, and it is to introduce the sixth in our increasingly ill-named trilogy series, Is It About a Bicycle? Um, Writers in Conversation, it is an online series presented by Solis Nua and Global Irish Studies that brings together contemporary Irish writers or writers based in Ireland with leaders and experts from a variety of sectors to explore their shared interests across disciplines and often across oceans. The title, um, if you know it, comes from Plan O'Brien's classic comic novel, The Third Policeman, which is a, a, a meandering tale about the nature of time, death, and the absurdity of human experience, existence. And if you don't know, um, Flann O'Brien's novel, you'll know that it is always about a bicycle. Um, but today's conversation may or may not touch on bicycles. I'm very excited about this. This is um, our first one of the autumn um, uh, and uh, it brings together Dr. Rosalind McDonough and Terry Cross Davis. And I'll introduce them both quite briefly here before handing over to them. Rosalind McDonough is a playwright, an academic, a social worker, a feminist, a columnist for the Irish Times newspaper and a member of Ireland's um, Academy of the Arts and Culture, Aesthana. Her plays include The Baby Doll Project, She's Not Mine, Rings, The Prettiest Proud Boy, and Mainstream. And her most recent commissions were Walls and Windows for the Abbey Theatre and Contentious Spaces for the Project Arts Theatre and I am um, Project Arts Centre. And I want to say, and Rosalind can, can correct me on this, but I think Walls and Windows was the first production by a traveller writer uh, on the Abbey stage. Um, I may be wrong about that. Rosalind is a board member of the Pavi Point Traveller and Roma Centre and was appointed a Human Rights Commissioner in Ireland in June 2020. Um, she completed her PhD on disabled traveler identity, and she's the author of, and one of the reasons why we're coming here today, she's the author of the recently published Unsettled, a memoir that explores racism, ableism, abuse, and resistance. Um, uh, and she's in conversation with our neighbor, our friend, uh, Terry Cross Davis, um, who will be well known to many of you uh, in DC, author of A More Perfect Union, in 2019, the winner of the Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize, uh, and also Haint from 2017, uh, which won the, Ohio I can't even say this word, Ohioana, is that right, Terry? That's a hard word to say, Ohioana Poetry, uh, Poetry Award, and she is the 2020 Poetry Society of America's Robert H. Winner Memorial Prize winner. And uh, many of you will know her from her work as the poetry coordinator for the Folger Shakespeare Library here in Washington, DC. I'm going to hand it over to Terry and Rosaline just now, but for those of you who joined us, those of you in the audience, thank you very much. Um, it's great to have you here, whether you're joining us from DC or Ireland or farther afield. Um, and we, I know that Rosaline and Terry welcome questions. So please, throughout the conversation, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A, just look for the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, uh, add them to the Q&A and Terry will get to them uh, as soon as she can, if she can. I think this is gonna be a lively conversation. We've had a good half hour talk in the green room over the last, uh, over the last while and uh, there's a lot to talk about, but we will definitely try to get to your questions. Uh, I'm gonna turn off my screen, kick back 
relax. Um, you should pour yourselves a glass of wine or a beer or a cup of coffee and enjoy um, the, our conversation uh, with Terry Ellen Cross Davis and Rosalie McDonough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colleen. And thank you, Solas Nua. And thank you, Rosalie, Dr. McDonough. I appreciate you being here today uh, to talk about Unsettled, your book, to talk about all the things. And I know early on we were talking and you were like, let's, let's hit it hard out the gate. <laughs> I'm with you. Let's talk about racism. And let's talk about your experience and the experiences of racism that you've been, that has happened in your lifetime. And yeah, so let's just start out the gate with that. I would love to hear your experiences with racism at, in, in Ireland. Okay, um, and you, you jump in whenever you want. First of all, we're both women. And so that's already a complex body to live in. And in Ireland, I'm an ethnic minority, but we only got recognized by the state in 2015, 2017. So for my history and for my ancestries, we weren't considered true Irish. We have our own language, our own heritage, our own culture, our own way of being and doing stuff. We have a particular dialect known as Gammon, I can't, and I suppose I'm imagining you as a black woman must find it really strange when I say I live in racism every day. You must be saying, no, you're not. What well, I would say is racism is the best context. So while I don't have the black experience of racism, I have another kind of experience, experience which is related to Roma, Roma people and travelers. And essentially, we are, or we were, or we are subordinates to Irish identity. Does that make sense? That makes so much sense. And even as you begin to talk about it and to say that there is a different culture, a different tradition, a different dialect, a different way of doing things, you could have equally been talking about the Black experience in America because for so long we were, and in many, for many people still are considered, you know, not Americans, not true Americans, even though this country wouldn't be this country without the experience of Black people <laughs> and, and the free labor <laughs> that we gave <laughs> unasked um, for, for centuries. Um, so, so there is that. And yeah, it just- I, I would also say that we are, Irish travelers are the nuisance that won't go away. They try to assimilate us. So we're kind of an embarrassment we're kind of a nuisance, mm. if you know what I mean. And we have similarities with the Maori people in New Zealand and the Aboriginal people in Australia. And you know what, Harry? We have more, more of our people are in prison than they are in university. Mm. That's a statistic I grew up hearing a lot in college when I was in college, that there were more, at that point, more black men in, in prison, in, in part of the prison industrial complex than there were in 
in schools of higher education. So again, the overlaps are sadly stunning. And it makes me think more about intersectionality in different ways. And it makes me think about who has something to gain from keeping a people in a permanent second-class citizenship, you know, and what are people truly afraid of if they are to give, and, and, and I almost hate the term empower because it assumes that there's someone in control of power doling it out in small slices to those that they find tolerable. But I just, I constantly find myself going back and thinking about who has something to fear and who has something to gain and just what does it mean to have to deal with this kind of racism on an everyday basis, not only to mention how it affects the body internally. There's a woman, Arlene Geronimus, she coined this term weathering, that within Black people's bodies, like a lot of times we're like a good seven years older than we may present because we have to deal with the high, you know, all these elements of the, the cortisol running ragged, all of these things um, for the moment you walk out the door, you're in a store where someone won't hand you your change or will slide it to you on the on the counter, which has happened to me. And that's, I wanted to go back because you in the book. Let me just stop you. you. I hear you, I hear <laughs> you. If I hear an island, if my family want to book a venue, a hotel room, we have to lie about our surname. You know, the minute I say my surname, people know already. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those. That was fascinating to me too. There were so many elements of your story that really caught me and sang to me. And that was one element too, that the surname was like a giveaway. Um, you know, for, for me in America, my skin gives me away, you know, and then also now I love also how language is evolving because we can say, oh, so-and-so is this ethnic identity, but they might be white presenting. So to acknowledge that it's not always what you see, you know, initially that someone so can be this ethnicity or this ethnicity, but be white presenting. And therefore we still need to acknowledge that there's a complexity to how we view ourselves and how we think of ourselves. I think for a long time, black people and their experience of racism was understood as colorism rather than racism. And in a way, people like me, and we owe you a lot. We owe your writers, we owe your women so much because they were able to articulate and something that we were. I mean, we have very different histories, but histories are about context. Don't you agree? As as you soon as you said that um, about about um, the color aspect of it, what popped into my head was Isabel Wilkerson wrote a book called Cast, which talks about how it's like less racism and more this caste system that America has created, um, and so that kind of blends into and echoes what you're saying because again. The color is a thing I can't hide. You know, I, when I walk into a room, when and where I enter, my whole race enters with me, whether I willingly want to bring it into the conversation or not, right? It's there, it's there. It's there. And, and the thing that frustrates me at times is when people want to pretend like it's not there because right. then you're erasing me. And so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about, about erasure. We were starting to talk about it earlier, but I'd love for you to talk more about that kind of erasure of who, who owns the narrative and like how important was it for you to write this book and, and craft and own your own narrative? 
And I'm not the first traveler to write a book. There's been a few before me. However, by way of Irish teacher, by way of academia and literature, we've always been the object rather than the subject, mm -hmm. whereby other people wrote about us, here, you know, and, and for me, I guess that nobody owns one story, that anybody is free to write whatever and whoever and imagination and all that stuff. However, I would imagine you would say, if you want to write about the Black experience, it does help a little bit more if you're Black. In the same way, the traveler experience is more authentic when it comes from within the community rather than from a settled lens. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I can I ask you to unpack one piece of language for me. And this was new, again, as someone who is not as well versed in all of Irish politics, um, settled versus unsettled held such de a deep resonance for me. Um, and I, I love how you kind of not just define, but explore what that language means throughout the book. Can you talk a little bit more about like how those terms came to be and who began to and who owns those terms in so many ways? Like who crafted the term and decided who would be settled and who would be unsettled? I don't know. Well, all I know is when I was a little girl, there was indigenous. I was from the indigenous community and the settled Irish were the dominant Irish. So we were indigenous minorities. Obviously, that's the official language, but there's all sorts of derogatory and vernacular names and terms about each other. We would have particular names about settled people, and they would have particular and derogatory terms for us. But I'm not a linguistic, and I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I don't know where it's. All I know is I know I'm not one of them. And they know I'm not one of them either. They keep reminding me of. I'm sorry, that's not really a good answer. Now you said everything that needed to be said. I am not one of them, and they, and they keep reminding me. And that's why I said, mm, yeah, I know that feeling well. Um, I get reminded a lot, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the. I was just um. So obviously I'm a poet and I was just in a workshop uh, a little bit before we this conversation and um, there's a poem I'm working on that pulls from tinder uh, data and on tinder black women are the least desirable on tinder right and we've been the least desirable I think since it started um, and Asian men are the least desirable <laughs> as well which just makes me think Asian men and black women just need to figure it out and keep it rolling um but but mm. <laughs> but so there's that that constant reminder that I'm not the standard I'm not blonde and blue-eyed and and white or even white presenting you know I'm not I'm none of those things so why do I have the audacity to try and eke out um a way of being and a way of calling myself beautiful and appreciating how I look and appreciating my culture 
right? In a society that does not have the tolerance for me, when again, thinks of me as least desirable on Tinder, right? So that way of constant, constantly being reminded of who you are and your place, it, it echoes, it echoes. But they don't even bother with the subtlety anymore. They don't even have the good manners to be subtle. They're just okay. so upfront. And, and I would say, particularly about my impairment, about my cerebral palsy. And although I've never been on Tinder, but everyday messages of ableism and not even around attraction, but more around being seen as competent or capable or responsible or adult. Do you know what I mean? It's like you're infantilized all the time. I Can I read from a little bit from your book? because you just hit the nail on the head for a thing. And I just wanna stop and, and invite people to put their questions in the Q&A um, as, as Rosalind and I are talking. Please don't feel like you can't get a word in edgewise, you can, and just put your question in the Q&A and I will get to it. But um, you talked about infantilism and there's also, there's a whole other thing too, I wanna to get to body autonomy too. But just to think on uh, page 21 in your book on the, in the body punishment chapter, this, this hit hard to me. Um, a child with a disability is cute and manageable. An adult with an impairment is awkward, dependent, clumsy, a burden. The first time I saw an older disabled person, my fear set in. And then you go on to say, you know, a woman, 19 or 20, my eight-year-old self panic. I'll be as ugly as she is, I thought. People liked me when I was a child. I had to stay small, easy to dress and easy to lift, making me walk, making me talk, pushing me, pulling me, marking me, shaping me, extracting me from myself. Just, oh, that hit hard for me because I have a brother who has cerebral palsy, spastic diaplegia, and he's in a wheelchair. Um, and I felt like you gave voice to a lot of the experiences that. I've had when I'm with him and that I, I wonder if he would give voice to if he had the ability to do so. So I just wanna thank you for that. And, and just, you know, talk a little bit about that if you don't mind. And, and I think, and how important it is to have an ability to see someone with a disability in various stages of life and, and feel an acceptance and, and see that mirrored, that how important that mirroring might be. Uh, I mean, we both agree that women are seen as dangerous anyway. And we both agree that black women are seen as ultimately very dangerous, very powerful, unmanageable. And then we, we see we have the traveler woman who is wild and untainable, and it's all about her sexuality. And then we have the disabled or deaf woman who is appeasing and pleasing and triumphal and, and you know, will fit in and will contort herself into being smaller and better and all these things. Ro Roxanne Gray talks about a lot. And what I love my cerebral palsy. I grew up by other disabled people. So to me, I mean, I, I can't by another body. There is no other body for me to be in. And, and I suppose it's really interesting. You talk with your brother and you watch how people talk to you rather than him 
when you're out together and I imagine all that stuff goes on. And for me, it's it's endemic. But what I really enjoy is literature and art it gives us an opportunity to kind of hold that mirror up. It's like, hang on a minute, you're not going to do this to me anymore. And, and I now do a lot of work with younger disabled women. And that gives me great joy and energy. And, and I learn their generation, thankfully, who went to mainstream school and who are now all in college, university. So they're articulate, they're strong there, and they tell me that. It's a bit like feminism. They haven't met the glass ceiling yet, but mm. they know they will. Does that make sense? They know yes. that at some point, their college peers, they'll go one way and we go another way. And of course, in the disability community, there's diversity and certain impairments are more affable than others. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Are, you know, it's a bit like black women, brown women, yellow women. You know, the whiter you are, the better you are. And it's a bit like the disabled bodies. The more you can, Emily's the non-disabled body, the more validated. I mean, you know all this. You know, <laughs> from my brother, you don't need me. Um, but it's uh, sometimes I'm lucky that I can wake up in the day, have a cup of tea, stay in my pajamas, and just think about this, or read about this, or write about this, because it's very complex. You know, it's, and I think it's, identity is ever evolving, and nothing is fixed, and that, and that applies around. The more it evolves, so does the perception of identity, does that make sense? It does, it does, and something... I, I think it's really interesting. In Ireland, transgender people, non-binary people, at the moment there's very few safe spaces. So they end up using our toilets, our restrooms, because well, to feel safe and whatever, but I think it's really interesting that our bodies almost prescribe not so much who we are, but where we are, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. It does. It does. You, as um, when you talked about like the the like comparison of like with darker skin the lighter you are you know there's the saying I grew up with if you're light you're all right if you're brown stick around if you're black get back um and, and it actually made me think of a Nidazaki Shange uh line from for color girls who consider suicide when the rainbow is enough and instead of you know my love is too precious to have thrown back on my face it's the whole idea of anything that's that exists outside the norm being thrown back in the face of the majority, it becomes an irritant. Like, you know, and so that that resonated in one way. Um, and so I just, and 
So yeah, yeah, <laughs> I was thinking about that. There are two questions and I wanted to answer them very quickly. The second one, someone said, okay, I came in late. What's the title of the book? It's Unsettled. Look at this gorgeous cover of this book. Ignore my, my notes sticking out here. That's the name of Dr. Rosalind McDonough's book, Unsettled. Um, and then the answer, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, always, I'm always like, yes, unsettled. Let's make sure people see it and if they get it. And then the second question, and I'm sorry, Rosalind, did you, did you have something to say? Yeah, maybe every time you say doctor, I get such a fright. I don't believe you're talking about me. I love my doctrine in nine before the pandemic and and when he's seventeen when he eighteen and so I almost forget and when people say doctor and yeah it brings a lump oh, no, no, like no. I I've known too many, too many girlfriends who have gotten their doctorates and not gotten the due respect that, that doctorate involves. Yes. So I am here, Dr. McDonough, all day, every day. Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to, the, someone else said, you know, I'm confused when you talk about walking into, into a room. Do you want to be trickingly because of race or no? I don't want to be treated differently because of race. I want my race acknowledged and I want it not held against me is what I want. I don't think that the whole idea of um, race blindness is, is, is appropriate, nor does it accurately address and respect my culture and the way that I was born and how I was reared in this country, learning two histories, the history of one that said, okay, yes, the Klan you know, chased my family off of lands that they owned and will never get back. Okay, so there's that history that doesn't, but not the whitewash history, you know, so I want my history acknowledged. I want that there's a Rosewood and a Tuskegee incident acknowledged and a Henrietta Lacks. I want all these things acknowledged and not just ignored when I walk, in, when I walk into a room. So that's what I'm looking for, right? And so I would say, Rosalind, how would you feel about that? What do you want people to know when you enter into a space? Okay. Well, uh, for example, if I get a commission for a play, I want them to know the play would be about travelers. It won't be settled Irish. It won't, you know, I, I mean, I'm not sure I can articulate in the way you did, but I want I want to be acknowledged. I want my identity to be something to be respected and protected and not someone say, Oh, you're one of those and when they move away or they hold their hand back or they or oh, they would say things like, but you're not really, you're educated and you're nice. And you're, you're not like the others. I can't be doing with that shit. No, I can't. I don't know this. I don't want to have to minimize my experience. Well, you know the phrase people say, oh, when you shut up, our life enough, we know enough. They can never know enough about racism and what it does to your psychological and emotional well-being. So I suppose I want people to be aware I'm here. Don't talk about me. Talk to me. That's it right there. Don't talk about me. Talk to me. Don't talk through me. Don't talk around me. Talk to me. And mm -hmm. I, I, I had to hold on to the cackles because the cackles were about to come out my mouth and I was about to cackle away and laugh 
when you talked about um <laughs> how did you put it <laughs> oh you're not one of them you're oh oh I actually explained the situation to my children not too long ago of um, someone who I was quasi dating who was not black and who, you know, said to me, oh, but, you know, uh, you're not like other black people. <laughs> like, we're going down the wrong road here. <laughs> That's not the way to go about this. And um, yeah, those moments too. And I think you mentioned it too in the book of clutching purses of locking doors that's the most hilarious one to me is like when you're by a car and all of a sudden the door is locked and you really think am i did you really think did you really think that i was scoping out your car to assault you in some way or getting on the elevator and people cross to the other side of the <laughs> elevator clutching that purse up like 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 your whole job and mission in life is to assault people and take their things and i'm like really because if that's you know it's just all the stereotypes that uh. exist and you, I and you want, yeah. When you're with your black friend and you have a white friend and they're trying to not so much fit in, but they're trying to say, oh, and I mean, when you're embarrassed and awkward, I know I've had an experience where my settled friends would say, okay, I'll leave you here with your friend. I'll be back in an hour because they don't want to be seen mm. with travelers or, I mean, the, the energy and the ingenuity they put into hiding or trying to hide their racism. <laughs> And it, and it's so obvious at times because you see it so often. Someone asks, you know, is it possible that you know, when when someone moves to the other side in the elevator, that they're just making space for you, or you seeing what you expect to see or want to see? I will clarify and say, I never want to have racism experienced. I never want to be in a situation where someone sees me and recoils because of my color and all the stereotypes that they assume to be in play. I would love to be acknowledged as Terry, as an individual. I'm a mom, you know, I'm a daughter, I'm an aunt, I'm a poet, I do all these other things. I would love that acknowledged, right? Um, <laughs> so I just, you know, so it's just these, these, these are things that um, it, it takes, it takes some opening of one's experience to understand that I'm not projecting because how is it that you and I are in two different places in this world, but can talk about the same experience, right? You're not projecting and I'm not projecting. We're calling out what we see. And, and that's all that is. Um, I wanted to, to, to dive into another thing because I just thought, again, when I, I was just so amazed at all the overlaps culturally between the two. And that was hair, because you have a section in here where you talk about your hair and you talk about you cut your hair at one point. And I just want to say that once I cut all my hair off twice, and I will tell you, I got the business from my great aunt and my grandmother when I cut my hair off. I was told a hair is a woman's crown and glory. What are you doing? How are people going to know you're a woman? <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure I got other things that they, they might know. You're not going to get a husband. Exactly. <laughs> You won't get a husband. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of things you are taught about hair. And um, if I can, I'll just, if I can read this one quick poem from my first book. Um, and it's called East 149th Street, Symphony for a Black Girl. Sitting too long, skinny cinnamon burnt legs cramped. Mama's thigh suctioned your ear. Relief was turning your head, a new view of the television. But nothing was better than matching candy colored beads, Symmetrical cornrows, braids swinging rhythmically, aluminum sneaking its shine through the hair's woven layers, and the freedom of skipping on sidewalks, blacktop driveways, running around backyards, listening to the beads clanging kiss, the crescendo then whispering this, 
music celebrating the movement of you. So when I, that, that was a poem I wrote in my first book about getting my hair braided which is like almost like a rite of passage for a lot of little black girls everywhere. And sitting between mama's thigh, getting your hair oiled, your hair brushed, your hair combed, the tenderness that is expressed and passed through generations and generations. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I just, I love that moment in your book when you talk about oiling, getting your hair oiled and brushed and thought, wow, this, this happens here too. I came from a large family, and there's, I have nine sisters, and we all have long hair. And my mother really enjoyed, we didn't enjoy it, but my mother enjoyed combing and oiling my hair and my sister's hair. My difficulty was that I just, I hated my hair because it was, uh, it was always nauseous. And having my hair combed or oil meant I would have to sit still. So I would dry and run away, and my sisters would have to run after me, and my mother would be kind enough to leave me for two or three days. So I wouldn't have to do it every day. And also, that was one part, but as a disabled woman, as a young girl in the institution, my generation, you know, a lot of the girls and their hand boys had their hair cut short because that was the way it was. And your hair needed too much attention. So until I started writing the book, I didn't realize I had all this information and experience in my life about my hair that nobody ever told me, oh yeah, I did that within my family. But then I asked other traveler women, and they said, yeah, we did that too. And it was a ritual. And I think I'm a now and an island woman, and I, I was never a very good-looking woman, but I was always a very interested woman. It is, it is, that makes sense. And I think our self-esteem and our self-worth is so much tied up in the veneer on the outside, what people can see, what they can touch. And, and once they touch it, or once it's tangible, it's no longer yours. And but I really enjoy my hair now. And yeah, I don't know what else to say. Well, no, that says a lot. Um, I will say I've had experiences where I've had to tell people that they are not allowed to touch my hair. I have a, you know, there have been those experiences where there's been um, the idea that the black body is public and not private. Right, and I, and I wonder if there are some similarities between the disabled body feeling public and not private. You talk about body autonomy. And I, and I found that interesting too. But when, when does your body belong to you, especially in state institutions and as seen by the state? Can you talk a little bit about that? I think it's very difficult for a lot of women, not just women like me, but our bodies are positioned as public property, either over-sexualized or desexualized, you know, one way or the other. And I also think that I am 
How can I put this? I know it's very. As a woman, I feel afraid. I feel definitely afraid in this body because I know I'm not anonymous. I know I can't hide in a crowd. I know people will remember what they saw. Does that make sense? I have no anonymity. A disabled body like a black body has no anonymity. It has that kind of a, a stare, and that stare is almost to erase you and dehumanize you. Am I making sense? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're singing to the choir and making a lot of sense to the choir. And as you talked about, um, either like a desexualized body or a hypersexualized body, I said, oh, yes, I know this too. That's Mammy, the Mammy figure versus the Jezebel figure, right? <laughs> Both exist within the Black female pantheon of how our bodies can be looked at. And um, and it was funny enough, someone just mentioned this to me in the context, and we will not, we don't have to go all the way here. There was a very good um, column about Meghan Markle um, <laughs> and the black body and the black female body in the space that's not meant for that body. Um, and so it just, I was like someone else that had picked up on that too. So all of that makes sense. We did have a question that wanted to know a little bit more about your work um, in the theater. And I love to hear more about that too. Um, and what was it like to see your work on on the Abbey stage? So if you can talk a little bit about your theater work, I think you know there are people who want to know more. Um, you know, you're a poet. I'm sure you have moments when you're trying to get rhythms arrived or in your work and you wondered. What am I doing here? I feel that way about, you know, I I think I, I have been trying to write plays for the last 20 years. And although there's a long history in the Irish canon of theater where travelers are positioned as the thief, the rogue, or the whore. But they've all been written mm -hmm. by quite settled, able-bodied men. And there was never any room for travelers to write ourselves into that genre. And an odd thing as well for young travelers we want to see ourselves. You know, it might be one more play about why Irish settlement. Jesus, I am me. Oh, you know, I just think, oh, you know, enough, enough. And I was very honored and very proud and very scared. And I, you know, after the Abbey, where do you go? You know what I mean? I'm worried. And, and yeah, but it was amazing. It was amazing for my family. You know, it was really important for the younger members of my family. And also, I lost it. I've never been in the Abbey as an audience member, let alone as a playwright. And also, it's, it's a testament to the people in, in the Abbey. And they now realize we're here, we write our own stories, and we, you know, invest in our work, and it'll pay off. And, but yeah, I loved it. I, I mean, it was all a bit of a dream, but I loved it. 
one one uh, question came. So I think in answer to you after the Abbey, where do you go when someone said, why not Broadway? Why not Broadway? Um, you know, and but I, I just want to go back and echo a thing you said, invest in our work and it'll pay off. I just think that's brilliant because it like it literally gives me chills just to say that out loud because there are so many stories that are not told, so many stories that have been assumed or who, who've been decentered from their own story. And I'm thinking about um, just the rash of, of, of incredible work we're seeing now from BIPOC writers, from, you know, and just, it just, and, and those within the disability community in crafting their own narrative. And that's the thing that feels so important to me is that we are now hearing more of a world of which and reflecting what we live. My husband works in, in um, he, he works at a Quaker school and he, he works in the office of welcome, welcome, equity, justice and belonging. And so we often talk a lot about mirroring, about giving children an opportunity to see themselves reflected back and how important it is. So for us, it was like reading, you know, the snowy day to our little black boy and little black girl. So you could see a story where you're in it, but it's not about your race, but you just get to be a kid, right? And, and, and how important it is to, to allow other people to see this. And I just think about the work you talk about now about mentoring younger students and, and what that mirroring is like. And, and just what would that have meant for you? I mean, I thought about that passage I read just now um, where you were worried about becoming an adult. What would it have meant for you to have that kind of mirror available when you were younger? I don't know. But what I will say to you, Terry, and I'm sure you know this, that even in this window of opportunity and this affirmative action moment, and it is only a moment. I know that, and you know that. The, the white settled man will still find his way in on our space. He'll be the director. He'll be the dramaturg. He'll be the editor. You know, we're never really trusted to manage our own business. You, you, again, you are speaking truth to power. You were truly speaking truth to power. Um, all of what you said resonates and echoes. Uh, there was a piece that went out in the DC area um, and it was like, you know, white theater, we see you, you know, we see. And it, it, it addressed some of those issues. Like there needs to be more directors of color and there needs to be more uh, <laughs> dramaturgs and all of this. So that when different narratives are presented, they're not questioned and interrogated for diverging from the mainstream idea of who you're supposed to be and what stereotype you're supposed to fit in. Um, there's a great question here um, and it is, and it, they say, thank you so much for this discussion. It has been incredibly powerful to hear. Do you think the human race, all our cultures are moving toward a broader understanding of identity and all its nuance or what still holds us back? I'd love to hear your answer to this. I think, um... There's a globalization of assimilation, pretending that we're all the same. And I think that's equally as damaging as blatant racism. I think there's room for more diversity and more equality rather than segregation. What about you? I think, I think each generation is starting to give me a little bit more hope. I see changes in my children's generation. They're Gen Alpha, and I forget the other one that they're, they're in. Um, so I think that we're seeing more of an embracing of diversity and recognizing that it's not about that it's not about just the whole idea of like empowering and it's about splitting 
of it's about splitting all these resources. It's about acknowledging the different voices in the room and not just for a moment, but forever. <laughs> like that's what I want. I don't want it to be, oh, I did this nice thing and I'm projecting my values, you know, and I'm going to make it look nice. I want it to be real and last and change. I want a new constitution, but don't ask me about that. Um, you know, but, <laughs> but I, I, I do, lately I have felt a little bit more hope as I look at my children, I look at their interactions with the world and I look at what they task the world to do and how it's, how they feel more like they have the ability to do that, to change than I did. I felt like I had to stay within the system and succeed. And now I look at them and they're like, forget the system. You know, <laughs> We're gonna break it open and do something new. And I love that. So I think we're getting there. And I think the more people read outside of their own comfort zones and their identity and recognize that everyone has something to contribute to the greater conversation and that everyone's voice should be heard, then, and even then I'm like, I'm, I'm aware of the ablest language in that to be heard, you know what I mean? So it's like, I want everyone at the table forever and ever, always, amen. Mm -hmm. and I, know, <laughs> yeah. I know I know our time is up for like two minutes from from the hour I can't believe this hour went by this quickly um thank you Dr. Rosalie McDonough <laughs> I really appreciated this time talking with you thank you Terry. and when you're in Dublin again call me will do will do thank you both uh this has been um uh, for those of you who are just joining us here in the audience, there is another person here. It is Mary Turkett, and I want to thank Mary Turkett for holding us together uh, on the technical side. But Mary and I were also sending messages to each other to say how this was a riveting conversation. And I don't want to pick favorites, but it might be my favorite so far of Is It About a Bicycle? This has just, just been so much to hear from you and spoken with such passion and such conviction. Um, this has been a real pleasure. Um, so Dr. Rosalie McDonough, thank you very much. And Terry, uh, our neighbor, our friend, it's great to have you with us again. Thank you so much. I dropped um, in the chat there just to remember that, um, that Rosalie's book is called Unsettled, and there's a link to the book uh, in the chat. And also Terry's latest book is A More Perfect Union. Uh, and there's a link to that book in the chat as well. Um, just a final word for me to say that Solus knows that the, the next, um, the seventh, I think, in the increasingly ill-named trilogy, um, Is It About a Bicycle, will take place on December 7th. We will have um, Irish writer, um, essayist Sinead Gleeson. Um, and um, who she will be in conversation with is TBA. Um, um, but it will be another riveting, uh, another riveting conversation. So um, Rosalind, Dr. McDonough, Terry, uh, and to Mary, who's been helping us out, and to all of you who are in the audience who are joining us live, but also to all of you who will be watching a recording of this, we really appreciate your being with us um, for what's been a fantastic and really um, intellectually bracing um, conversation. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I'm sure we all have. So thank you very much. I think uh, our uh, webcast is just about to end right on time. That never happens. <laughs>